Right, and uh, I want to, I, I'm very grateful for Dylan's sharing um, of his family. I think he's also your family now. And um, actually, my grandfather had, had been through 228 as well. So it's been a critical period for all the Taiwanese during that time. And now, um, you know, time is different, but still we need to know and to face the history and to learn about it, okay? And to cherish the, the freedom of speech and everything we have now in Taiwan, okay? All right, welcome back. I believe you had a great vacation. Now we'll continue on our, um, you know, previous discussion on um, code switching, remember? Okay, now, um, let me know if you have any question or anything you want to share with us, okay? Feel free to press the hand button and raise your hand and turn on your ca uh, microphone and camera, okay? We will have a group photo today. Is that okay for everyone? Yeah, I think now it's only Dylan and I are turning on our camera. Am I right? Okay. Yeah, let, let us see your face if you want to, okay? <laughs> All right, so stay with us. And um, it's good to stay focused while you're turning your camera on, but sometimes it's a little bit tiring or too stressful. You can turn it off for a while. But I hope at least at the beginning you can turn it on, right? <laughs> 各位同学, 打开, I think turning on the camera is a, you know, a sign of showing the respect and showing, um, you know, being friendly to your classmates and your teacher, your professors, right? Because we are turning our camera on, right? For the for the purpose of interaction, I think turning on the camera is also showing, yeah, showing a sign of respect and friendliness, right? Dylan, don't you agree with me? I do agree. Um, I think that sometimes there are reasons why you'd have the camera off, but I think that in university, as we all are, we should all have a good workspace to attend this class, uh, someplace where we can have the comfort to turn our camera on. So if it's possible, I think it's good if everyone turns their camera on to show respect. Yeah, okay. So has anyone turned it on yet? <laughs> no, not yet. Are you there? Are you muting me? Am I muting? <laughs> Am I muted? Well... 好, it's for the, you know, it's for the group photo and also for the attendance of this course, okay? Ooh, right, attendance, everyone. good. Yeah, yeah, attendance <laughs> is important. I, I don't often call your names, but I think turning on your camera is uh, a sign of showing me that you're alive and you're there, right? It's okay, you're having breakfast being home, that's fine. I love the background image of your dorm. Thank you for sharing that with me. And Bulong Wani, Jalo, welcome in. Jalo, why do you need to wear your mask? Uh, are you are you okay? Is everything okay? Hi, Leo Jingting. Wow, I love the cafe behind you. It looks nice. <laughs> All right, welcome in everyone. So, is it possible that someone can take a photo for us? Any volunteer? Any volunteer attention? Welcome in. Shelly, hello. Okay, anyone? Okay, is it possible that uh, Jing Ting, can you take a photo for all of us? Please cue us as a one, two, three, or something. <laughs> <laughs> Let us get ready for a group photo, everybody, for your attendance and for just a warm up for this course, okay? Okay, Jing Ting, let us know when you're taking it. Are you taking it now? <laughs> oh, wait for a second. Okay, we'll wait. What what Jing Ting is setting up? Everybody turn on your camera, right? So I know you're there and I know you're good and I know you're fine and you're joining us. Okay.
Hi. Hi, hi, everyone. Yay, I can almost see all of you. Good. Okay, so 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 are you guys ready? Yay, are you ready? <laughs> Just for linguistics. Okay, let me know when you're pressing the button. All right, all right. One, two, three. Yay. Yeah. Okay, Yay. one more, one more. One all more right. with some pose. <laughs> so, okay. Yay. One, two, three. Yay, okay. Okay, thank you so much. Good to see you guys. So stay with us uh, if you can, all right? So I will, sometimes I would love to see the student's facial expression too. That's a good sign of interaction, right? Okay, now let's start our lecture now. Um, thank you for um, smiling, at, smiling in front of the screen. So now we will talk about second language acquisition. Um, there's a very important term which we call fossilization. So what is fossilization? Fossil, you all know fossil, right? Hua shi. Fossil is um it's like you know the uh the, the moment that you you it's like frozen and freeze fossilization. So what's the fossilization in language? It actually um it is defined as the non-native forms as part of either the morphosyntax or pronunciation can become fixed. Okay, the, the concept there is fixed and cannot be changed, except for example, the foreign accents. So, well, well, you know, to some extent, I think it can be changed. Okay, I still believe that through training or through practices, it, it can be trained maybe, especially before the critical age, 13 or 12. But still, I think a fossilization here refers to the forms that's in your pronunciation, the phonetic form, the morphosyntax patterns that's in the language, usually the second language that become fixed. And um, it's it become part of the way you talk, you articulate, and it, it cannot be changed. So that's fossilization. So in second language, that happens a lot, okay? Hi, Brian, welcome in. All right, you just missed the group photo. We're gonna have one more. Okay, just kidding. <laughs> Brian, are you doing okay? Welcome in. All right, so um, yeah, Dylan, do you think that we can change? I mean, the fossilization, I think mostly it referred to the adults, adults learner or, you know, some aged uh, second language learner. But I mean, for the early age or for the young learners, I think it's still possible to be changed. It's not, so we won't call it fossilization. Okay, everyone? Yeah. Dylan, maybe you can share some of your opinion with us. Yeah. Sure. I think that there is something to fossilization, but I think that that's an extreme way of stating it. Fossilization makes me think that nothing you can do will change it because it's already set in stone. Yes. But I think that even adult learners can learn to change their accents, just maybe not their natural accent. Um, as an example, one of my good friends works for Tutor ABC, and Ooh. he's been working for them for about eight years now. So of course he speaks very flawless American English because that's what they want. And actually he, yes. train, he trains other teachers. So he, <laughs> he speaks very well and he's very eloquent and uh, with yes. good pronunciation. But uh -huh. I went over to his house last weekend and uh, he made gumbo. He's actually from the South. He's from Atlanta, Georgia. And when wow. he started talking about that gumbo, his accent started coming out. And we had a hard time understanding what he was saying because he was talking <laughs> like the South. And it was the funniest thing for me because he still has his Southern accent. It's yeah. just that he's learned to also speak in a standard way. I think that's that could be fossilization because in his heart, he still has his accent, even if he can learn a new one. Yes, that's a very interesting case. And this is also what I want to share. Uh, another example is also from one of our uh, previous TA. Uh, we have um, Southern uh, Southern African uh, students from South, South Africa, and they actually learn and they speak um, South African English, right? With the South African English, the accent, it's more British and it's not American English. However, they did the same thing as, as your friend did. They came to Taiwan and started to become English teacher. And they they know that, they, they're aware that oh, American English is the mainstream, the, 
thing they need to do while they're being the teacher. They started to learn and adjust and to adapt to themselves to speak like Americans.、Mm -hmm. However, they told us that when they're with their friends from South Africa, their family from South Africa, they can still switch back to their the language, the、um, the way they speak, the South African, the English they used to speak. So. It's interesting that、um, it's interesting that you can learn the other accents. You can still do that. Usually, for the professional purposes, for your work or for academics, for work, usually for work, it's the best motivation, right? But still, you deep in your heart, you you have you know the language for such a long time. You speak, it's it's、uh, you speak the first language. Like my friends, they speak South African. English, more、uh, British English. So, they they think that it's it's become fixed and it cannot be changed. You know, even though they learn another form, another accent of English. Okay. So now let's move on to the next concept: transfer. How about transfer? So,、um, transfer is actually the concept that's similar to what you have understood. Uh, a speaker's native language influences learning of another language. It can be transferred. It could facilitate or inhibit the learning of the second language. So, many people said, "Wow, European students can speak so many languages: Dutch, German, English." You know what? Actually, Dutch and English have similar systems, more similar systems than Chinese, right? Than English and Chinese do. So, they're really closely related languages and. These languages, I, I mean, they. If you know Dutch, and then you learn English, it can be transfer, and it can、um, help the speaker, the learner, to learn the second language more easily.、Um, you know, than maybe the speaker from Japanese or speaker from Chinese. Okay, all right. So the specialization for the sounds of our native language can interfere. With learning the phonological system of a second language. Note we mentioned phonological. Phonological is the sound pattern. So the sound pattern is actually one of a very important, you know, fundamental how you articulate, how you pronounce those sounds. Okay, so it can be one of the reasons why second language learners usually have a foreign accent, and if they,、um, you know, learn a language that have a similar phonological systems. Usually, it would be,、um, you know, they, they, we we believe that it can be transferred more easily. So, have you noticed any example of transfer? Think about it. But, in the transfer this part, the teacher wants to add something. That is, that in the past, many studies have shown that in the past, similar systems, similar phonological systems, may, you know.、Um, Help the speakers learn the second language more easily. However, there are still some studies challenging that. Some studies thinks I believe that even though those two languages have similar systems, sometimes it may interfere each other. Okay, do you think so? Do you have any opinions on that? Anything you want to share with me, Dylan? How do you think about this? On、um, the you know the similar system, two languages. In my mind, there's a little bit of both.、Um, I think that if two languages are similar, if, for example, a Dutch speaker wants to learn English, there's a lot that's easy because、uh, the pronunciation might come more naturally. The grammar may not be so foreign. <coughs> many, many things. Of course, the the script. They all both use a Latin script, so that makes it a lot easier. Roman letters,、um, as opposed to say a Dutch person trying to learn Japanese.、Um, <coughs> there's also something called a false friend. I don't know if anyone's heard that before. A false friend, where you think it sounds like something in your language, and so you assume that it means the same thing, but actually it doesn't.、Um, for example, if anyone here ever goes to Italy, and you go to a coffee shop, a cafe in Italy, and you want a latte, and you see that on their menu they have latte, so you order a latte. You'll be very disappointed to find when they give you a glass of milk with no coffee in it, <laughs> because in Italy latte just means milk. Oh, just my milk. Yeah, I made that mistake once. So, so it's a false friend. You might think there's a similarity, but it actually trips you up. Yeah, I think for the lexicons that you just mentioned, so it actually has different meanings in Italian and in English, since English、mm -hmm. borrowed it from 
Italian, and then it become a new word in coffee. That means half milk, half uh, espresso, right? So right. latte can have different meanings in different languages. For example, like uh, that's a false friend. That's a very good one. And also, like I just. Um, you know, had a dinner with a friend from China. They actually moved to Chicago for a long time, so they actually moved uh, to the U.S. for since they're in uh, teenagers. However, they they still speak the English. I mean, there's a fossilization of Chinese that they still they still speak Mandarin Chinese in a mainland China, you know, mainland China accent, mainland China word usage of word. So they told me, Tiffany, have you been to this fan dian? And for Taiwanese, we think fan dian is hotel, right? But for for them, they they said they told me, I said, fan dian. He said, this fan dian is good. I said, oh, uh, fan dian, you mean? The buffet there, the restaurants there, they said, no, Fan Dian actually means restaurants in mainland China, right? Okay, so that's a very interesting case. So we do have the similar phonological system in mainland China Chinese, mainland Chinese, and I mean, Taiwanese Chinese here, right? However, the commentation, the meanings can be different. Okay, but still, it's interesting that they said um, while they're growing up in the US, they still speak like their family and friends in the mainland China because it's um, how they learn Chinese, right? It's fossilized in their Chinese as well. So they said they're not used to the way how people, because now they're staying in Taiwan, they're living here for work. And they say sometimes they need to switch to Taiwanese Chinese. Okay, it's different. Like a fan dian, hayo woman in Chinese is potato, but in uh, Taiwanese, we, we think of to do as um, peanuts, hua shen, right? Okay, that's a very interesting case as well. So transfer, okay, it can, um, it can be extended to different um, aspects, so think about it. All right, now factors for successful bilingual learning. Okay, so how can bilingual learning be successful? Now we are ready and we are preparing for the future generation for the bilingual nation. Now, what are the factors for successful successful bilingual learning? I think first the learner's age do play an important role. That's why. Um, now we are trying to train more bilingual teachers and let the kids um, have a very good and English friendly environment starting from a younger and earlier age. So the learner's age plays an important role. As I mentioned previously, the critical age hypothesis, it's uh, the age of puberty. Okay, the second thing is the working memory. Okay, so working memory, um, you know, and uh, motivation and context. So. Working memory here actually refers to the, you know, the brain, how the memory, um, how the working memory, 你的这个记忆, 你的, uh, 在学习当中的记忆, uh, 这边讲的记忆不是长生的, 不是long-term memory, uh, 这个working memory 指的是在学习当中你怎么, how much you can learn and perceive and um, produce, process, process. So the working memory here needs to be adjusted based on the uh, learner's proficiency level. And it actually depends on the teacher and students, um, you know, how, how well they, uh, how well the teacher designed the teaching plans and how, you know, how suitable the teaching material can be for the kids. So working memory is a very important and subtle field However, I think the teachers need to work well on that. The teacher need to prepare well and to, um, you know, teach the students for the good, with the good instructions to let the kids have appropriate and proper um, learning environment with the working memory to learn well. And motivation do plays a very important and large role in the level of fluency the second language learners will achieve. Okay, motivation 在这里提到的是动机哦。那你知道 motivation 很重要就是一个重点就是孩子要能够用 I think motivation for me, I would say it connects with the usage. It definitely connects with the usage and also the context. So it's very important to provide the context for the kids, for the students to learn, to use the language. So they will have the motivation. They will know why they're learning this. Okay, remember we talk about why linguistics is important at a first meeting? 
that's because I want you to know. I hope you can it can actually boost the motivation, let you have the motivation in learning this subject. That's not, not just because you need these credits, but because you are motivated. You believe it is important. All right, now um, for the motivation of learning linguistics, uh, I had a very interesting joke I want to share with you. There's a joke I just heard from one of my friend. Okay, he's also a professor and he told me that his um, students in his previous linguistics course said thank you to him because um you know 他的学生呢最近在这个跟这个呃先生的啊不对不是先生他的男朋友的家人见面哦然后呢那天他很紧张 I'm meeting my future mother-in-law it's so I'm so nervous it's a big thing for me right 他见他男友的家人然后 I think they're ready to um, you know, ready for the next step. And then he said, and then she said, what should I talk to her? I don't know. But, you know, during their meeting, it went out so well because she shared what she learned from linguistics with her because her uh, mother-in-law, future mother-in-law asked her, can you speak Taiwanese? 你会说台语吗? 然后他就回答说, oh, 我还好刚打一哦而且呢我知道台语呢在台湾不同的地方有不同的accent哦台语其实在北部中部南部都有不同的accent我们在语言学的时候老师有讲过那个北部的枪怎么样南部的枪怎么样然后我们家是讲什么
you can keep also I think that's also a good record as well yeah you can keep it as a data all right so um, for the teaching methods there are so many different ways of teaching method there's synthetic approach which is more bottom-up okay so bottom-up means you start from the single word start from the you know er, uh, the very the vocabulary the sound the vocabulary and then you taught the phrase the sentence the um articles that's the bottom of synthetic approach so it stresses the teaching of grammatical lexical of uh, the lexicon the vocabulary phonological how to pronounce those sounds and functional units of the language step by step I mean, traditionally, the teacher prefer this way of teaching synthetic approach with a bottom up approach. And it is widely adopted in our, um, you know, um, I think elementary school and junior high school education as well. The grammar translation method is one of a very famous one the with a synth synthetic approach. It focuses on learning lists of words and rules and translating passages. Some students find it very useful and it can be very um, systematic for students to learn with this kind of approach. However, let's take a look at the analytic approach, which is more top down. OK, so with this approach, it assumes that uh, adults can extract the learners or adults can extract rules of language from unstructured input like a child does with first language acquisition. So with this analytic approach, um, it's more content based and it actually uh, proposes that the teacher can maybe play the music, play a story, you know, um, play, uh, uh, read an article to everyone not starting from each vocabulary in the article, but read the article first, read the picture book, read the, um, play the music with the content first. And with those content-based instruction, it focuses on making language meaningful and getting students to communicate, to comprehend and communicate in the target language, but not instead of um, teaching every single bits, like the vocabulary, the sound, you know, starting from the beginning, it's more, um, with a top-down approach. Okay, so there's a group discussion for you. Which do you prepare when you're learning language? I think most of you have experienced both. So which do you prefer? Why? Please share with us in your, um, in, in your uh, maybe in your chat message there. Think about it, everyone. You can type in your chat message or you can raise your hand. Which do you prefer when you're learning English or other languages? Synthetic approach or analytic approach. All right. 好，这边请大家在 chat box 跟我们互动一下，这两个 approach 你比较喜欢哪一个呢？请你帮我打上来，可以简单叙述原因，或者是你也可以就是打你喜欢哪一个。我们来调查一下，好不好 ？Okay, you can send a chat box, send a message in the chat box to us. Okay, thank you, Brian. Top down. All right. You wanna Share more with us. Okay, why is it Brian? Hey, 这边我在问大家问题哦，请大家要回应哦。Please reply to this question. Which do you prefer? Which approach do you prefer? Okay, that's okay. I'll give you a couple of minutes. Maybe some people are still uh, typing. Typing in. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Okay, top down, bottom up, top down. Okay. Okay. I appreciate we have a mix of answers here because it shows that neither one is correct, you know? Yes. True, totally. Indeed. And neither one is better than the other. I think they're both um, different approaches of teaching second language. Mm -hmm. But maybe I think synthetic approach is more widely used traditionally in 
also in our uh, public education. But now I think the teacher are trying to incorporate both. And especially in the bilingual classroom, we encourage the teachers to um, actually um, not just using the synthetic approach, but also the analytic approach and with a more content-based, content and language integrate uh, hypothesis, uh, mm -hmm. integrate approach, Clio, right? So, yeah. Okay, some said, uh, because it seems, okay, thank you for sharing the reasons, Bo Long. Mm, okay. I think for more advanced learners, uh, analytic approach do is more interesting and it makes sense to you because you know why you're using it, right? And it seems more natural to you because using the synthetic approach for Brian. Brian, do you want to turn on your mic and talk to us? Bolong, feel free to turn on your mic mm -hmm. microphone, okay? That's a good point, Brian. Lose interest in learning language. Oh, more emphasis on grammar. <laughs> Yeah, many students said that. Hmm. Many students do mention they don't um, they don't enjoy while they're being they're learning grammar and having lots of exams on it, right? Bottom up. Okay, Jun T mentioned bottom up synthetic approach. Okay, thank you guys. Now um, think about it and. Um, you can observe that in your language learning courses too. All right, let's move on to the next one. So teaching reading. Is it hard to teach reading? It is. Learning to read is totally different from learning to speak or to sign. I mean, sign is for sign language, okay? So for sign language, uh, sign language users, uh, they can learn to sign. However, learning to speak or sign is different from learning to read. Okay, so children learn to speak or sign at a very young age. For example, the uh, we will talk about the language acquisition, the developmental stage, actually starting from age one or two, the, the babies can start babbling and starting to communicate, try to speak to you. However, reading typically does not begin until children attend school or they, um, you know, started earlier, uh, started uh, usually started later than speaking. Ability. So all children acquire spoken or signed language, but not everybody learns to read and write. 大家要注意到为什么有这么多的文盲,illiterate,就是因为其实所有的小朋友或所有的人,其实最终在如果在一个正常的情况下,有人跟他沟通,或者,you uh, know, Common spoken language learning to read and write is not for everyone. Dylan, you can share with us, yeah, to follow up the previous question. Oh yeah, sorry. I, I didn't want to distract. I just oh, thought of an analogy I thought would be beneficial for the students. Um, when we're speaking about learning languages, top-down approaches, it's like it's like playing basketball. If your goal is to play basketball, then a top-down approach is to just keep playing basketball, just trying. While a bottom-up approach would be like drills, practicing dribbling, pra lifting weights, you know, running, uh, things like that. If you want to be really great at basketball, they're both important because you can work on the pieces and the overall game at the same time. But they're they're linked, but they're not the same. So if, if a, someone only does basketball drills but never plays basketball, they won't know how to play. And if someone only plays basketball but never does drills, they might end up being okay at basketball but never really great. So you need both to become great. Thank you, Dylan. That's a very interesting analogy. And, um, yeah, I think... Although some people think synthetic, some people think that synthetic approach or bottom up may be painful during your studies, but still um, you need both because for the um, top down approach, sometimes you are learning it, the meaning, you know, you comprehend it, you can communicate, discuss it. However, if you want to really be good at it, you still need to focus on the um, 
the vocabulary, the grammar to actually be really advanced and really good in this language. Okay, so I think these two, you can work you, now. You're all very good in English now. You you can use both approaches to help you when learning language. 我觉得两个其实都很重要。那真的这边讲的很好玩哦，就是说其实一个有点像是基本功。哦，我觉得 Dylan 这边讲很像我们中文会说基本功夫、基本功，然后一个就是像一个呃，就是说，比如说像打篮球啊，或者是一个呃一个运动的呃嗜好。好、哦，那你可以去享受那个乐趣，但是你要做基本功来练习，好、哦，来让你变得呃体力呀、啊、各方面肌力变强。那其实这两个是 you you know um they're interactive and they can help each other. Okay, all right. That's a very good analogy. 好，那这个其实呃，我们刚刚讲到包括 learning to read 啊、哦，我们来看一下，像在这个 reading 的这个部分，老师就会提醒大家，其实 reading ability 其实，嗯，要学会阅读这件事情，说真的就比较没有办法用 top down。OK， 简单来讲就是说，如果你要真的是能够 ，if you want to train the an independent reader, it's very important to You know, do it as a routine, and the, the training actually requires more、um, the bottom and bottom up approach. Okay, so a reading requires specific instruction and conscious effort, whereas acquiring a first language does not. Oh, 大家要记得一件事情，就是说学习阅读这件事情其实是蛮辛苦、蛮不容易的。那呃、uh, ，you need to. Uh, there, there should be specific instruction. You need to learn how to match the sound and letter. The sound and letter in English is sound and letter in Chinese. Wow, it's the sound in each word in Chinese, right? 我们的中文又更难，因为每一个字有每一个音音还有 e. Okay, 那英文是你要当然 sound and letter 最有名就是 phonics. 哦、uh, ，有 phonics is a kind of approach. Um, there's also there are other also other approaches, but the specific instructions are very important to help the students to be ready and to know how to match those sounds and letters. So Language, the written language, and conscious effort and training needs for the students to acquire the reading ability. Okay, that's a very important thing to know. 那老师在这个地方，我要提醒 all the teachers, especially the bilingual teachers. I always remind them. Okay, 当你放任何东西在 PowerPoint slides, when you are presenting anything in your elementary school classroom, you should not assume the students can read on their own. Because they can't, they're still learning it. So you have to be careful, you know. For especially for some teachers, they would just,、um, you know, include lots of words, lots of,、um, you know, English usage, English words in their PowerPoint slide. But you cannot take it for granted that the kids know how to read because they haven't learned how to read. They're still learning it. So it's very important for the teacher to prepare the materials also with a good instruction, also with a Good language support given to the students. So, those keywords, those、um, you know things you presented at the PowerPoint, should be something they have learned,、um, maybe in their English course or they have learned in the text, the materials you've given, and it has to be elaborated. You have to elaborate and illustrate and explain it to them and read to them. Okay, you should not assume. Okay, I've seen, I've witnessed many teaching. The teacher just point at the PowerPoint slide and say, "Can you read it? Let's read together." But they haven't learned how to read. How can that be possible? Okay, so in Taiwan's this language school teachers, we actually often remind many foreign language teachers and foreign language teachers, foreign teachers. You you cannot imagine these children know how to read. When you put those English words in the PowerPoint slide, please help them guide them. Guide them and read with them, and tell them the meaning, and show them how to pronounce the words because they haven't learned it. Most of them haven't learned it. If they have, it's not from you. It's from the cram school. Okay, 好，老师各位记得哦。你你会觉得说啊，我可是我带他们念，他们会啊。我们会跟各位老师说，那个是他在补习班或他小时候学过，或是他在家学过，不代表班上每个人都会。Okay, as a teacher, you have to keep in mind you're there for all the students, not just for you know. 一点点 ，a few a few students or a very few students who can already read. You're not there for them. You're there for everyone, right? So learning to read is different and it's difficult. So you have to be there to guide them and teach them, and then they would 
learn how to read through your teaching. OK， 这个是很重要的，所以各位要记得哦，千万不要以为说小一、小二就会念哦、呃。你要想说班上会念的，他是因为他有学过，可能他早就会了。你要为那些还不会的，或是还在学的人，要一起把他们放入你的教学中，一起去考量到，那带着大家去念，这样子才能够，嗯 ，you know， 嗯、um,。这样才是一个 teaching 该有的一个呃、哦，该有的一个这个 philosophy， 对不对啊？将、哦、了解我的意思吗？所以这边要提醒大家这一点，我觉得非常重要。所以 one 呃、uh, for the bilingual， if you want to work， if if you really want to work it well， as I said， working memory 很重要，对不对？所以 working memory 在你教的时候，其实孩子们就在学，就在记，就在呃学这个字怎么念，怎么用， how to use it， how to pronounce it， what's the meaning of it？ so Be sure not to put too many words in the slide. That's also very important. Like it's not a good thing for their working memory. Okay. All right. 老师们要记得喽。好，那在这边我也鼓励大家，如果你在教未来 ，if you're teaching a bilingual subject, you have to know what is taught in their English subject. The textbook, the vocabulary, the process, progress in their English subject. You have to have in mind what's the proficiency level of these kids. What is the language that they have learned in their English subject? And then you have to incorporate it in your bilingual subject. That's also very important. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. So, what are the three main approaches in teaching reading? Okay, there are Hobart approach and phonics, as I mentioned previously, is very popular one, and the Um, the whole word approach teaches children to recognize fifty to one hundred words through rote,、uh, through, through.、Uh, I think there are some typo there. I'm so sorry. Through learning and the other words are learned. 应该是 root learning， 对不对？我这边好像打错了，不好意思。老师改一下哦。Sorry. Let me let me revise it a bit.、Um, 是 ，OK。好，这边我们要谈的是，嗯、um, ，Wait, let me come back. OK, can you see it? OK, can you see it clearly? 有改了吗 ？OK, great. Thank you so much, Dylan. OK, so check my. OK, all right. So the root learning here means, um. You know, sometimes you teach the kids root words, root words. So root learning and the other words are learned、uh, gradually. So the whole word approach it actually focuses a lot on the morphology, the word, the root word, and the、uh, the word, the composition of words. And actually, the kids would learn like ed is added to the past tense or the root word like、um, some. Some root word in English and how to add a different word to compose into a new word. So that's the whole word approach. And usually we teach the kids to recognize the shorter, the simple words, and then you would extend it to the longer or more complicated words. All right. For the phonics, it emphasizes the correspondence between letters and sounds, so kids can sound out words. But there are many inconsistencies with English spelling, as we mentioned previously. So phonics,、uh, it works well with the more systematic ones. However, for the inconsistencies in English spelling, the teachers still need to、um, tolerate some errors, some mistakes that the students will make during the period that they are learning phonics, and especially for the spelling, because they are learning to sound out. It happens a lot that the kids would write in their diary or their word book with a wrong spelling word. However, it sounds like the word. Okay, so that that happens. So what would the teachers do? Anyone? How would you react if the students are sounding out the words based on the phonics you taught them? However, it's a wrong spelling. What would you do? What should the teacher do? How would you react to it? Anyone? My answer is that you should be happy because they're learning the sound pattern. They're learning the phonics with you, and it's not a totally a bad thing, you know. They're learning. They're acquiring it, but it's still not the fault from the not the students' fault because there are so many inconsistencies in English spelling. 
you have to teach them that, okay, for this word, you have to memorize. The spelling is not how it actually sounds. It's, it needs to be memorized, practice, and you need to teach them and correct them. But don't be angry and don't be frustrated because it's not your fault or the student's fault, okay? All right. D Dylan, maybe you can add on something. Yeah, we have the same um, teaching philosophy there. Yeah. We do. And for me, yeah. I think uh, the key thing that you said was the, the phonics that you taught them. So as, as yeah. teachers, I mean, we're the adult in the room, right? We should never be angry that our students ever learn something that we taught them, uh, even if they, they take it too far. I mean, that just means that they're really applying themselves and they really learned it very well. So as you said, it's a stepping stone. If you first learn the phonics and then after you learn the phonics, then you learn all the exceptions and the, and the strange you know, spelling rules of English. So don't, don't be upset about it. Just view it as one step. You're not there. You're not finished, but it's one step. Yes, that's true. Thank you, Dylan. Um, it's it's a starting point. It's that they're still acquiring it. And Dylan mentioned a very important one: exception. There are so many exceptions in language, and especially in English spelling. Right? Um, sometimes there's no rule to describe it, or it's not just uh, fitting the rule so well. So you have to teach them separately. And as a as the next step, you can tell them, okay, so this word, although it sounds like this, it has to be spelled like this, okay? You have to teach them and don't worry if they made mistakes, okay? And don't blame yourself on that, okay? Be sure, don't blame yourself or your students. All right, it's the problematic language, okay, that we need to learn and acquire. Don't worry about it. All right, so the whole language approach assumes the children approach reading as a natural activity that children would do on their own, like speaking, and focuses on encouraging children to make their own connections between letters and sounds as they explore text. Okay, now whole word, whole language 跟 whole word 跟 uh, phonics 就有点不一样 Whole language 它比较像是用一个也是 top down 的方式哦，比较是 immersion 的方式。他认为 they believe the children will. You know, through the songs, maybe through interaction, through story reading, the story, the children will do on their own. They can speak and they can read, um, you know, of naturally and make their own connection between letter and sounds. But I do think for the whole language approach, it it actually it, it can work well, but it takes a long time, and it there may be individual differences. There may be a you know, variety of um, different progress in your classroom while you're using a whole language approach. Oh, uh, 那这个部分就是比较是 immersive 的 immersion 的做法。他会认为孩子会自然而然的学会阅读，但是你要给他很多可能大量的，比如说歌谣啊、故事啊，很多的 input， 让他自己学会阅读。那这个通常会有一些 individual differences 哦、uh, ，在小朋友的学习上会有蛮大的差异。Okay, all right. Now I'm like, just like, can you share? So literacy in the deaf community. How's that in the deaf community? So hearing children can rely on their phonological knowledge to learn to read. However, deaf children cannot, right? So, um, actually, how they can learn to read is that they learn. They can learn manually coded English, and it can help them learn how to read. So um, actually for the deaf children, they can also learn how to read. And there are studies showing that they, while they're exposed to ASL, American Sign Language early, earlier, tend to become better readers. Okay, so that studies also show that and um, propose that deep knowledge of one language may help in learning other languages. Okay, that also apply to the deaf children. And not just for the hearing children. Okay. 那这里说的 ASL 这个 American Sign Language 就是说，如果今天呃有听不到的小朋友，他很早家人或者是学校有在教，或者他很早就接触到 ASL， 其实他也很快就可以把更容易把这样子的一个 knowledge 哦，这个对这个语言的认识来用到他怎么学会去阅读这件事情哦，这个是可以互相影响的。Okay. All right. All right. For the bilingual education, there are still several 
uh, programs now in American. Now we're ready for we're ready. We're preparing for that. And now there are several bilingual education programs in American schools for immigrant children. Those are the examples from our textbook language files. Um, there are transitional bilingual education (TBE). There are bilingual maintenance (BM) and dual language immersion. So for TBE, students receive instruction in both their native language and English, with the native language support being phased out over the years. 好，这边讲的就是说，它一开始就是有呃两个语言 ，native language and English. Okay. 那但是呢，呃、uh, ，as as the students become more um become better in the in English, the native language support will you know being phased out over the years. 就会越来越少，也就是说，它会越来越多的英文哦。这是一个 transitional transitional bilingual education. 好，那再来就是 bilingual maintenance. 这个是嗯、um, 所有的。For their entire education, students remain in bilingual classes. So, 所有的课程在这样的学校里 in this program 全部就是都是 bilingual. Okay, all right. And for the dual language immersion, um, native and non-native speakers are enrolled in bilingual education. The it to mix them together, mix the native and non-native speakers. The goal being to have all students become bilingual. 那这种就是希望是双向的 dual language immersion， 把母语人士跟非母语人士的小孩子，呃，这些 speaker 都放在一起，然后让他们达到 bilingual。但这次当中，其实有时候 it actually depends on the you know the language status and how powerful the language is. Usually, the if there's English speaker in this um. Community or in this program, I think English still be dominant. I mean, in in America, that's the case, right? Maybe Dylan can share more with us since this is the cases from American schools for、sure. immigrant children, especially. Yeah. Sure. Yeah.、Uh, as you say, dual language immersion. It's it's not so simple because, of course, one person can only be speaking one language at one time, even if they switch back and forth. Just because you you only have one mouth, so you have no way to just switch between two languages. It just as I just did. You can only speak one language at a time, and then, of course, depending on who is enrolled and what their language abilities are, and and what nationalities of students, Americans and what, and and Mexicans and Germans and Chinese and and what. So there's dual language immersion schools. There's a whole spectrum of how they do things, and it really depends on each individual school. Thank you, Dylan. Yes. So actually, um. It depends, and、um, remember that previously we have、uh, you. You have a classmate called Emmy. She's also in your program, yeah. And Emmy told me that she actually she has studied in a French and English bilingual school starting from a very early age. So yeah, that's also. I think it's more like a bilingual maintenance BM. Yeah. So she received a BM program.、Um, You know, like a twelve-year BM program, so she she's very good at both English and French, yeah. And、um, yeah, there are different、uh, programs, different forms of bilingual education. And now for Taiwan, we are actually developing our own bilingual program as well. That's、uh, different from what they are doing in the in American schools. All right. So research indicates. That immigrant children benefit from instruction in their native language. So,、um, bilingual classes they do allow children to first acquire school-related vocabulary and speech styles while in their native language.、Um, it actually it, there are many positive feedback, positive、um, you know reviews on this, showing that they it's it's good that they can still、um, learn in the bilingual setting, bilingual classroom. And these classes also allow them to learn content and and to keep up with English speaking children while they master English. That's the positive things about it. And、um, these students in bilingual programs they outperform students in English only programs. Studies show that. Okay,、um, they outperform these students English only programs and students in BM programs outperform students in TBE programs. So、um, the BM programs actually. Maintain、um, to to maintain both languages. Try to keep those two languages in the programs for the entire learning. However, the TBE it switch and it switch to English in、uh, for the long term. It's still in English. So 
There are studies showing that BM outperform TBE and bilingual outperform English only. And these are some positive, um, you know, findings showing that the bilingual education can be beneficial for the immigrant children in this um, in this setting. So despite these findings, bilingual education has been under attack, just like we have it here in Taiwan, has been under attack since the 1970s. And in some states, it has been replaced by sheltered English immersion programs. Okay. So for the sheltered English immersion programs, you may check some information on that. Um, you know, there's also some critical thinking uh, question for you. So how about the policy of bilingual nation 2030 in Taiwan? It's a, you know, hotly debated issue. And it's also hotly debated issue in the U.S., I, I, I suppose, right? Dylan, can you share more with us uh, what you know about sheltered uh, programs? <coughs> Is it in your school or in your community? So, <clears throat> sorry. I suddenly... Don't worry. Yeah, no worry. <coughs> dying. Okay, oh. I'm not actually dying. Um, I think we need a break. Yeah, we need a break. Maybe soon. Yeah, uh, yeah. So sheltered immersion, sheltered English immersion programs, if I re am remembering correctly, it's basically trying to get students who don't speak English fluently into mainstream classes as quickly as possible. So usually like for two or three hours of the school day, they'll have their own classes in their own language. But the goal is to get them into fully English language classes as quickly as possible. And the goal there is usually um, like culturally or politically motivated. The idea being that if you let, say, allow a Mexican student to continue to take classes in Spanish in high school, then they'll never become normal citizens, whatever that means to the people designing these classes. So the goal is they want them to get used to speaking English as quickly as possible. And that means that not allowing them to continue in their in their mother tongue. Um, and all with all decisions, there are good things about that. And there are bad things about that. Uh, but every state's different in America. So how they do things is different. Yes, yes. Thank you for the uh, thank you for your great uh, the information. Actually, for the sheltered English immersion programs, there the goal is to help those kids to become as uh, fluent in English as quickly as possible. And um, there will be some ESL, um, you know, the ESL course for those kids once they join the public school. There will be some time and the, the school will make some time and effort for those kids to help them improve their English and to work with the teacher in a group, in a specific group. And they would also um, provide exams to to uh, test those students to see if they have um, followed, they have um, made some progress. So they they need to take this ESL or not. So you know, some immersion program, native speaker. 那其实这个也是有很多的争议哦, whether it's good or bad for the kids. 那会不会影响孩子的confidence或是他的self-identity哦, 本地的local teacher, local student都一起来这个做双语的这个教学，所以这个又不太一样，跟美国的这个goal是不太一样的哦。好， okay, let's move on to oh, oh, okay, so there are some group discussion topic. Think about it, everyone, and um, now we'll take a break and we'll be back for the next session on language acquisition. Okay. Um, Dylan 跟我都说了很多话, take a break, and I hope I can hear more from you guys. Okay. Share your opinion with me if you can. All right. We'll take a uh, take a break and we'll be back at um, uh, 11 25. Is that okay? Okay. See you back at see you at 11 25. Yeah. Thank you. See you later.
All right, welcome back, everyone. Okay, all right, welcome back to the second session. Now we're ready for the language. Are you ready for the language acquisition? Um, I think so. Hopefully, everyone's here. <laughs> Okay. All right. Welcome back, everyone. So um, for the second part, actually, I will go through it quickly because nowadays, you know, you know, uh, how many of you have used chat GBT? It, it become a very uh, popular and, um, you know, very helpful and useful device that, uh, you know, the AI that actually challenges all of us, right? Now, 这边我要讲的是说, um, 大家有用过ChatGPT吗? 用过举手? Have you chat with ChatGPT or tested him or ask him questions or discuss something with him or her <laughs> or just ChatGPT itself? Okay, all right. Now, um, I do think nowadays teaching and learning, um, you know, based on the AI, the, the developing era, I think we should all, you know, um, you know, take this challenge and try to change ourselves into be more adaptive in this um, kind of device. 也就是说，我觉得我们需要去改变原本的呃教育学的模式. Teaching and learning also needs to be. 那我接下来要讲的就是说我过去 for the last semester I tried to provide the lecture as much as I can and try to um, provide you the topics to discuss now I know that most of you can find and search for good answers or good information online now you know that the source is very important um, ChatGPT, I think one thing, one most problematic thing about ChatGPT is that I'm a little bit concerned about the source that um, the ChatGPT is providing, the answers. How, how many of you have checked the answers provided by ChatGPT? Is there any source given? Have you asked ChatGPT to provide the source? You know, many professors or students have told me that um, Actually, while we are trying to communicate and to talk to ChatGPT, it can provide great answers, very convincing. However, the source, you know, it still remain questionable, right? So you have to still have, you, you know, yeah, D Dylan agree with me on that, right? So although it seems convincing and it's so eloquent, well written in those answers, you still need to double check and you still need to make sure whether where, where the source is from? Why is it saying that? How did it answer a question? You know, you should remain, you know, you should remain doubtful. Yeah, yeah. And at, at least for Google search, I think we can still um, check the source and see who wrote this and the reference. However, for ChatGPT, it remains quite mysterious on that part. So I think you should um, always um, remember to you know, human beings, you're still the one who's making choices, making decision to verify those arguments. That's that's what you can do, you know. And it's interesting that you can have some great in-depth discussion with ChatGBT. However, what, what it said, you should double check it, okay? Dylan may also have some, yeah, Dylan may also have something to share with us. I've used ChatGBT before, and as I typed in the chat, it's basically, to me, advanced Google. In that you, you, it's it's a very cool device, but it's very cool. It's it's, it's just so yeah. confident. It states yeah. things as if it is the word of God Himself. I can as if yeah. this is the truth. I totally agree. Yeah, and, and like why why is it true? Why everything? Like to to, to scholars and and to high level students like us, we can see that maybe it's not true. But to a lot of people who don't really know how it works, I think it might be very dangerous to use. It can be dangerous. It's like, you know, whatever it says, it, oh, that's right, that's correct. But everybody's sharing what they asked GBT, chat GBT and what they answered in reply. But it's <laughs> there, there's no um, specific source or reference, but it's just from chat GBT. So according to chat GBT, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, yeah, there's still some bugs. You're right. I think it's still under development and it's a very advanced AI technology. But still now um, in my course, I hope that during your presentation, 
you sometimes you can include ChatGPT comments or ChatGPT answers in your presentation, but do tell me it's from ChatGPT, okay? That's the first thing I need you to be aware of. And also you can you can challenge ChatGPT. You can also provide more source and reference to, you know, tell us what this is about, what this term, what this concept is about. Okay, try to do that and incorporate that in your presentation. 好，接下来因为老师这一门课 language acquisition， 我接下来会介绍一些 theories， and I expect group one would also、um, share more fun facts and details from these theories because I'm not going through every single term today. I hope this could be more student-centered while you're giving your presentation. So as long as it's a student-centered, well-organized presentation, I do encourage you can check with ChatGPT if you you don't know where to start at the first. I think it's a good starting point for you to explore something, as a you know if you don't know where to look at or what to what direction you may um want to answer or reply. But still, I hope you can think about those questions. From your, you know, 先问问你自己 ask yourself first, and then you can give it a try with ChatGPT. If you, if you're doing a giving a presentation, 我觉得现在的时代你可以去尝试用，然后去看看他怎么说，听听看他怎么说，用在你的这个报告里头，你可以告诉大家，哎，这个 term ChatGPT 怎么说？但是我们来看一看，我觉得更厉害的人就是你更再来看，你再找更多的资料，然后你来验证。哦，甚至你可能也有跟 ChatGPT 不一样的想法。You know, his answer actually is not 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 everything. It's just part of the, you know, like the ice tip of a iceberg, the tip of an iceberg. 有时候一个问题 like an iceberg 就是一个冰山的一角。Maybe ChatGPT only presented the, the ice tip, the tip of it, right? 只有一个部分。但是你可能可以去看冰山的其他的面 ，other perspective, other aspect. 你可以去探索。That's the interesting thing about knowledge, right? That's the um, you know, as an advanced learner now, advanced undergrad students. Okay, 你们都是大学生了。我觉得要更 critical thinking. 那这些 AI 绝对是很有趣，也能帮助人类在。我觉得是做更深层的思考。Oh, deeper learning and deeper thinking. It can be helpful, but as Dylan said, it can be dangerous, and sometimes it's too intuitive. You know why? Why did he say that? And why? 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 Mm -hmm. Okay, and Dylan and I will be there and to discuss with you and to challenge you. But don't worry, don't worry. We're there to, you know, make this presentation more, more um engaging and, um you know, informative for everyone. And we always need to check the source. Okay, when you are saying something or making the argument, that's very important. Um and. Significant in your learning. All right, now I'm going to start the language acquisition now.、Um, for the contents, there are theories that we are、um, going through today, and we will also talk about first language acquisition if we have time. If not, we will、um, continue that next、uh, next week because for the presentation, I hope it would be within one hour. Okay, so we still have some time for further discussion and、um, you know to add more details.、Um, To share more with you after the presentation, and also for the fourth、uh, part is how adults talk to young children. That's also one of the very important thing we need to learn for the bilingual language acquisition. You can、um, you can、uh, ignore that part because we have already、um, explored that in our previous section. Okay, all right. Now let's start from the beginning of the theories. So there are some theories I. I will guide you through the, some keywords there, and I will share some main concept with you on these theories. But I'm not sharing with you all the details now. That's not what the teachers are doing now, because the AI, the Google, the database can also share lots of information with you. However, I hope I can be there to guide you and also share some important key concept with you and to provoke your thinking, to to initiate those thinking. Those learning process of of this journey with you, okay? All right. 我希望现在在这个阶段，我们不再是把 Oh, thank you, Dylan. Thanks for sharing. So, as a teacher, it's not 
that I repeat or share all the information, the detail information, and I say, okay, that's all you need to learn. No, that's not how we're teaching now. I mean, as a professor, I hope I can guide you through this and I can share with you some important concept in this field, but that's not all. That's not all, okay? You still, you, you can still, you still need to take this step and then explore and examine and to learn, you know, to collect those data and to uh, navigate on your own, okay? All right, so first an innate hypothesis and then imitation theory, active construction of grammar theory and connectionist theory and social interaction theory. All right, so first let's uh, move on to the innateness hypothesis. This is one of the most famous one. And um, can you all see the screen clearly? Okay, good, all right. This is actually designed by one of my grad students. So uh, it's very lovely. The design is lovely, uh, but she made it, I mean, she designed it into a PDF uh, file form. So um, I will share this with you after the class. Okay, don't worry. All right, for the innateness hypothesis, there are two very important concepts you need to know. This is a hypothesis underlying many, many theories of language learning, uh, language acquisition, that asserts that language ability is innate in humans. Okay, so while I, I'm going through this PDF file, please be, um, please note that um, maybe I cannot have as much eye contact as I can have on the screen because um, I need to turn off the Google Meet and use the PDF here. So um, let me know if you need anything, raise your hand or make some sound. Okay, don't worry, I'll be, I'll be back to the Google Meet. Google Meet. Okay, all right, now it's working. All right. So, as I mentioned, this hypothesis asserts that language ability is innate in humans. Innate is what it It's in you. It's in your brain, in your body. It's in you. Innate is what it is. It's born with you. It's inborn, innate. That is, humans are genetically predisposed to acquire and use language. So he thinks that humans are just by your genes set. You are just you are just will talk. You are just will learn language. Okay, and you are just will use language. Okay, usually this language is just native language. Okay, all right. It means that every person is born with it. Just will learn your native language. Will use your native language. Okay, this theory claims that babies are born with the knowledge that languages have patterns. And with the ability to seek out and identify, to recognize those patterns. Okay? Some theorists have even claimed that humans have innate knowledge of some core characteristics common to all languages, such as the concepts of nouns and verbs. So it's only just that this is the first concept we're learning now. Linguistic universals. What is linguistic universals? Okay, this universal is not the universal studio that you love. Okay, it's linguistic universals means every human being have innate knowledge in their brain. There are some core characteristics like nouns and verbs. Everybody has those concepts. These basic features shared by all language are called linguistic universals. Okay, are you, are you totally agree on that? I think, yeah, these basic features shared by all languages, especially for linguists, yeah, we do agree that those concepts of nouns, verbs, adjectives, yeah, it's linguistic universals. However, it may have different forms, different patterns, different usage in different language, right? Okay, so the linguistic universals. How about the universal grammar? Okay, so if we said that there's the there's the linguistic universals, the features shared by all human beings, then the in the theoretically inborn set of structural characteristics shared by all language is known as UG. There's a famous word, uh, people would say UG, UG, <laughs> a cute name, UG. UG is the theoretically inborn set of like, uh, like coding or like the syntax, the grammar that is 
inborn in our brain as UG. So some theorists believe that human beings are born with UG in their brain. Okay, all right. No one knows exactly what the contents of UG might be, though this is currently an active area of research in linguistics. You know, still there are theorists and researchers, um, huge debates going on whether we are we have UG inborn or not. However, the claim that linguistic ability is innate in humans is supported by, you know, originally the work of a biologist. Okay, you're going to find out who, who that biologist is. I'm just giving you a clue now. It's actually starting from the work of biologist Eric Lanneberg. Let me check if the oh, okay. This one's the how that the subtitle is pinned wrong because this the the problem. Eric Lanneberg, I'm going to write this down. The B group of 同学，到时候你们会有机会看到这个 Lanneberg， 我把它排拼给你们。先打字啊。好，在这边 Eric Lanneberg， 再试一次。Okay, this guy, the biologist, is actually the one. Who started? Who started? Um, you know, propose and to make the claim, and to claim that language is innate. Okay, it's actually started from the biologist Eric Lanneberg. 好，那我们请第一组的同学到时候再分享这个生物学家 Eric 跟后续 innateness hypothesis 的关系是什么？ OK， 这个我们很期待第一组要再回答的问题哦。所以接下来的 group presentation it's more challenging for you during this semester, but it will be really fun because you're gonna look out, look for the answers on your own, not just given by the teacher. OK, I believe it will be a great training for all of you. All right, now who's this little girl here? Her name is Jeannie, and there's another little girl called Isabel. Isabel. OK, so. Remember, we talk about the critical period that、um, there's a age, the critical period that、um, describes a period of time in an individual's life during which a behavior, in this case, the language, must be acquired. That is, the acquisition will fail if it is attempted earlier, before, or after the critical period. Okay, so the critical period for language acquisition is assumed to extend from birth. To approximately the onset of puberty, which is about twelve, as I previously mentioned. Okay, so let's check these two specific cases now. All right, these two cases are actually the real story, real, real situation that、um, they are the first evidence for the critical period hypothesis comes from these children. These two children actually they are very.、Um, They have been、um, in、uh, unfortunate, unpleasant circumstances, with exposed to little or no language during their early lives. Okay, so for Jeannie, what's the case? Jeannie was found in 1970 when she was nearly 14 years old, and she's isolated since the age of 20 months. Okay. However, for Isabel, she was discovered in 1937 at the age of six and a half. Her mother was deaf and could not speak, and、um, you know, actually, these two girls, what, what, after they were found, Jeannie's language acquisition was completely slow, very, very slow. And although she did learn to speak, she used a very abnormal speech. Her speech was abnormal, not like. You know, not like normal people. She was able to memorize many vocabulary, but her expressions were, were formulaic. Is it only like what is X or give me X? So the grammar,、mm -mm, she never learned grammar, but she knows vocabulary. She knows some vocabulary. So that's the, you know, results. The the、um, the genies, the the results in the. Uh, progress in Jeannie's learning is that she can pick up some vocabulary, but she never learned grammar. However, for Isabel, she began the lessons at, at the Ohio State University after she was found, and actually, her mother was deaf too, and her mother could not speak. And it's unfortunate that Isabel's Isabel's grandpa kept Isabel and her mother isolated. In the same room for many years, but but he has not mistreated them. 
he just kept them there in the same room and isolated from the other people. However, Isabel began lessons at the Ohio State University after she was found. Although her progress was first at low, two years later, it soon accelerated. It soon accelerated and in two years, her intelligence, her language were completely normal for a child at her age. So she, she picked up the language in every aspect and she, she learned the language, she acquired the language well. And there's a huge difference between Jeannie and Isabel is that um, Jeannie had been, it's a very sad story. Jeannie, what happened to Jeannie? She had been mistreated by her father. And when she was little, her father would beat her when she make noise. So her difficulty with language have multiple, can be attributed to multiple factors, multiple causes. Okay. So for your group presentation, please take a look at these two cases, Jeannie and Isabel, and share more with us and tell us what's the connection of these two girls, how they learn language, how they acquire language, and what has it, what, what is the relationship between the age they were found and the critical age, critical period? Some said that Jeannie was found later because it's already 14 when she was found. However, Isabel was found when she's only six and a half. Okay, that's a critical difference. However, how they were treated, how they were, um, you know, being taken care of when they were little girls still make a huge difference. Okay, the case of Isabel is also a little bit problematic because she was locked in a room with her mom, but did her mom and Isabel, did Isabel and her mom communicate with each other? Yes, they did. They did not speak to each other, but they developed a rudimentary personal gesture language, something like a gesture to communicate with each other. So we do think there's something special about Isabel there. Okay. So you would, you try your best to find out and share with us, um, you know, with these two cases and their relationship with the innateness hypothesis. Okay. All right. Now there's another stronger evidence I want to share with you here is um, this one. So there's a very interesting case about the deaf community in Nicaragua. And this is a very famous, uh, there's a very famous uh, ISN idioma de signos Nicaraguans. Okay, so this is also a very famous evidence, a very classical evidence in um, how the children, you know, how the children acquire those language and become full fledged with a complex system of grammatical rules. And there's a there's a story um, behind it, the home sign gestures. And that is also the keyword I'm giving you now. I hope you can check out those facts and share with us. Okay. 好，第一组的同学，这次呢，我会比较希望你们挑战一点哦，就是我我希望你们找这些例子。Okay, check those examples and share more with us. 老师在这边先提供一些 keyword image for you as a clue. Okay, now you're gonna solve this in your group presentation. Okay, 所以我们到时候期望看到 Jenny 还有 Isabel 的例子，然后还有对比这个在这个 Nicaragua 的例子。Okay. This is also a stronger evidence supporting both the innateness of language and the critical age hypothesis for first language acquisition. 记得我们这边讲的都是 first language acquisition. Okay. All right. Now we'll move on to the next one. All right. So there's a uh, actually something you need to know about the uh, feral or neglected children is that these evidence are really sad and heartbreaking. But but these are the evidence. Um, showing that um, some children who were neglected by their caretakers, the feral or neglected children, feral children just is some, uh, just is like a Tarzan, you remember know, Tarzan, just uh, some children grew up in the wild, often with animals, with, uh, without any human beings, um, the, without any caretakers. When these children were rescued or discovered, researchers attempted to help them acquire language. And this actually helped us look into the mist mystery of the language acquisition, you know, 
and uh, the success of these attempts depended largely on the age at which these children were discovered. Okay, so this side, these these students, they, uh, these students, these kids, these language learners, whether they can pick up the vocabulary, whether they can pick up the syntax, they can acquire syntax. It depends on the age. So this is closely related to the critical age hypothesis. Okay, all right. Let's take a look at the imitation theory. Second, the imitation theory. So even if languages uh, all right, even if language decision is an innate human behavior, there is a question, you know, still remains of how specifically it is acquired by children. So um, the first theories we will, two theories we will discuss have generally, you know, um, you know, been refuted. You know, many people are d disagree and they challenge and think there are so many um, errors and mistakes in the, in the innate hypothesis they challenge it however there's a grain of truth in both that keeps them part of popular belief okay 前面接下来讲的这两个innateness hypothesis 就语言是天生与生俱来能力跟 imitation theory 模仿的语言是一种模仿的能力我们怎么学语言我们是透过模仿的 imitation 这个其实是一个非常 popular widely believe okay widely believe by you know common people 大部分的人 even though there's much about the acquisition process that they are incapable of explaining. 好,那我们现在来看一下 imitation theory. 好,比如说呢,在这个韩语,你会发现 Korean children, Korean child, 有的人就会说,如果一个小孩, if a child is grew up in a Korean family, then they will learn Korean. It's because they just imitate their parents. Okay, if that's the case, a Chinese child, a Chinese children, uh, some Chinese children born in a Chinese family in a Chinese, exposed to a Chinese environment, they could speak Chinese, they could acquire Chinese because they learn to imitate their parents, their caretakers. Okay, in other words, they do think a child's genetic, um, you know, the genetic, the genetic uh, inborn ability is actually related to what is it, it is exposed, what environment it is exposed, because it all depends on imitation. Okay, so in this part, the language acquisition is that children, language is from mimicking, is Okay, all right. Now, then there's a very classic um, exception here. All right. But the children never heard anyone say, never hear anyone say go, G-O-E-D, goad in English. If a kid is born in an English-speaking community or English-speaking family, will they hear their parents say, I goad to supermarket last night? No, they would say I went. But why do the kids make mistakes like that? Okay, that's the first challenge. Think about it. If it's just imitation, why the children make mistakes like this? Who are they imitating from, right? Okay, so this is a very good uh, example that's challenged this theory. 小朋友不是只有模仿。小朋友,如果只有模仿, if they're just imitating, where do, this, where do these errors come from? Go, go, but go, the past tense is went, right? Okay, now let's move on. So that's the challenge for imitation theory. What are the other challenges to imitation theory? How? There are many other challenges in, uh, you know, to that. So group one, think about it. And everyone, please think about it. Anyone? Anyone? Okay. The most serious fault of imitation theory is that it cannot account for how children and adults are able to understand or produce new sentences. You know what? Language can be creative. Sometimes you say the sentences you never said before. Every day you are making new sentences. Trust me. But how can you understand that? How can you produce that if the kids are just imitating? It makes no sense, right? 
Okay, so that's the fault of imitation theory. Sadly, it's not true. Okay, <laughs> 这个很明显就不是真的。所以你以后听到有些人说，小朋友只是在模仿啦。好，知道怎么反驳了吧 ？Okay, yeah. Thank you, Dylan. Great comments. Dylan 说的很好。Dylan， 你要不要再鼓励大家一下？ Sure. Basically, Tiffany is helping you in your presentation right now. So please pay attention. If you can explore these hooks more in your presentation, then it'll be an interesting thing for us all to learn. Yes, those are the hooks, the clues that I'm giving you now for your learning. Okay, I hope you can navigate and find out those answers on your own, and with your classmates and with us. Okay, we're doing this together. Okay, reinforcement theory. What is reinforcement theory? I love this. 其实我蛮喜欢 reinforcement theory 的 <laughs> You can tell because um yeah, I think it somehow is in my teaching. So reinforcement theory asserts that children learn to speak like adults because they are praised, rewarded, reinforced when they use the right forms and are corrected when they use wrong forms. Okay, so if they're doing great, you give them. Encourage, encourage them, reinforce them, and when they are making errors, you correct them. However, the claim that parents and other caretakers frequently correct their children's grammatical mistakes and praise their correct forms is still unfounded. Okay, such corrections seldom happen. Um, some parents do correct their children, but not always. You know, <laughs> not all the parents, because um, still um. We focus more on the meanings and what we're communicating in the content, not just grammatical form. But I mean, for linguistics professor, mommy, maybe we love to do that. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mike. 我我有时候会想要纠正我小孩语法的问题，但是不是所有的爸妈都会做这种事情。OK， 所以这个 reinforcement theory 其实呃、uh, 有一个很有名的例子，我们来看一下下面 where the rule come from. Where does the rule really come from? Not all the parents like to explain grammar to their kids, right? So there's a famous example like this. 好，那我要跟那个 Dylan 演一下，好不好？还是谁？好，请一个同学。Any volunteers want to play the kids? Play the role of the kids? OK. Um, Brian. 好了，还是谁？哎，那个。刚刚有在吃早餐的炳宏，好了，炳宏，炳宏应该吃饱了，有力气演一下，裴老师演一下。炳宏 ，Can you be the little kid, the boy over there？ 是右边的那个吗 ？Yeah, yeah， 右边的 Bubble。好，炳宏来哦 ，Come on。哦，好好。是我先吗？你先从右上的 ，from the、uh, top right,、oh. top right、yeah.。Nobody don't like me。No。Sweetheart, say nobody likes me. Nobody don't like me. <laughs> Now listen carefully. Say it, it's like this. Say nobody likes me. No, nobody don't likes me. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. So actually, is reinforcement working there? Oh、uh, no. <laughs> Note that although this kid, Bing Hong, Bing Hong 弟弟呢 he does not form negative sentences in the same way the adult does. So, 第一个他不 imitate, not reinforce 也没有用我纠正他也没有用 Correction is not working. Um, actually, imitation 完全没有用对不对？因为这个句子大人不会讲，所以 imitation 已经破功了。好，我们再来看 reinforcement. 他也不完全听你的、啊，为什么？ Actually, the child's utterances—they actually they're acquiring it. That they're developing their own grammar. That leads to that brings us to the next theory. So, 这边你说所谓的 reinforcement 到底要不要去纠正 correction 有没有用 Um, research shows that um very limited. Okay, 不一定有用 All right, 小朋友其实他不会完全重复 not just repeating because he's still acquiring the grammar, still developing the. You know the structure and the how how you're you should where you should ask and actually the nobody don't nobody don't nobody don't likes me it's the way the children think they should express negative sense so he wouldn't want to just correct and follow your pattern because he still not he didn't get it right so reinforcement theory can still challenge it. How about the active construction of a grammar theory? All right, that is also a very influential theory of language acquisition. It holds that, 
Okay, this is also one of my favorite one. That children actually invent the rules of grammar themselves. Can you believe that? Okay, so the ability to de develop those rules is innate, but the actual rules are based on the speech children hear around them. That is their input or data for analysis. So, just now, Bing Hong gave us the dialogue. I gave him these inputs. It's actually still useful. You see, he starts to add s, right? Because he's developing his grammar. Bing Hong gave us the third sentence. Bing Hong gave us the third sentence. Nobody don't likes me. Because he he is actually inventing the rules, developing the rules of grammar themselves, and that kind of ability to develop rules, they actually they try to receive those inputs and to develop. Okay, so for the ed, also how to pronounce ed. Think about it: how you learn how to pronounce ed, like needed, holded, okay, and walked, and eat into ate, right? Okay, these rules actually you receive many inputs、uh, while you're learning English, and you try to figure out and to、um, learn those rules to acquire the rules, right? Okay, now how about the next one? How about the when, whenever there are mistakes, what should we do? Okay, now it's almost twelve, so I'm gonna stop here before you're getting too tired or too hungry. Think about the active construction of a grammar theory. I'll share the PowerPoint slides with you for this week. And Group One, please be prepared. Be prepared because you're going to present next week, right? Is it too fast? Um, 对第一组的人来说，你们会不会需要再延一周？三一五，会需要吗？还是你们要？呃，我们下，因为我们这边还有一些要讲的哈。那这样子好了，嗯，我们本来 March 15， 老师这边要宣布一下，本来 March 15， 我们要做的是 online sub online submission for reading test。那原则上我这个部分的活动，我会嗯 March 15这一天呢，我可能会调整一下，我们会把 reading test 稍微呃移到后面，然后我们 group one presentation 可能移到三一五比较好。大家这样可以吗？ March 15。But I have to, I have to、um, have the meeting online on March fifteen. Is that okay for you too? March fifteen online. 还是大家可以吗？还是要三一五可以吗？还是要三月八号？第一组的同学可不可以发言一下 ？I need to check with you guys. <laughs> 可以吗 ？March fifteen. March 15 that day, I'll tell you guys that we need to be online. Online that day, uh, is my meeting needs to be online because the teacher that day is, uh, we will have a meeting, uh, is people are not in Taipei, uh, so that day I'll give you a virtual. Is that okay? Dylan, is it okay for you to do it online? Yeah, that works. So does that mean that next week we'll be at the school, but the week after we'll be online? Is it okay? Yes, yes, sure. Yes. That would be the case. Okay, so we'll meet.、Uh, still meeting the same schedule for March eighth, but the group one presentation would be on March fifteenth. Is that okay? And you will have more time to prepare. I think that would allow you have,、uh, with more time to prepare and to、um, discuss and work with your group members. Okay, because it's the first group presentation, and I hope it can be. It can also set up as a good. Example for everyone, a good role model for everyone. So group one 可能会有一点点压力，但是我希望你们尽力，呃，做出一个就是很好的报告。Okay, present well and be a good example for everyone. Okay, 好，那我们就延到三一五 present group presentation， 然后三月八号我们下礼拜我们就一样回到教室上课。Is that okay? All right, Dylan. Anything you want to add on or encourage everyone? <laughs> Um, not really. Just this might. <clears throat> I mean, you you guys have all done presentations before. You know that it's it's some work, but it's not、uh, the biggest deal in the world. And、uh, you you got this. Just present your information. Be confident. Have good sources, and you'll have no problems. Thank you, Dylan. Remember, yeah, try your best and be well prepared. I think all the good presentations. 
takes a lot of preparation and effort and work with your teammate. And take it as a chance that you're teaching us. Okay, pretend you're teaching us and guiding us. You know, helping us to learn. Okay. All right. Try your best. So we will still meet online. Um, online meeting on March fifteenth. Okay. And for the group presentation. And don't worry about the reading test. I think I will postpone that. Um, you know, you don't need to worry about it. But just be sure to join us online. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Now, have a good lunch break. All right. 好，大家好，是午餐哦。那我这个录影会传给大家，然后 Dylan 这边的 script 也都可以提供给大家。没错，没错。This link will still be active, so please go back to this and review the transcript if you like.、Um, and if you give it about twenty minutes, the AI is going to go back over it and correct some of the issues,、um, like make the words that were chosen wrong. So it'll be even better in about twenty minutes. Oh, great! Thank you. Oh, so it will automatically it will self correct it. Or, yes. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, you can go back to it after twenty minutes. I think after the lunch break, when you come back and review it, it would be better, right? With more、mm -hmm. accuracy, with better accuracy. All right. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. See you next week. 老师，拜拜。拜拜。好，回去复习。拜拜。Yeah, please bye -bye. review those slides. We will come back again next week. All right. Group one, 加油 everyone! 不是只有 Group one， 大家都可以预习一下。拜拜 ，Have a good lunch break. 谢谢老师。拜拜。拜拜拜拜。谢谢老师。拜拜。谢谢拜拜<笑> yeah, you sweetheart. <笑> bye bye everyone. Bye bye. 啊、uh, ，有问题都可以留下来问。谢谢。Thank you, Shelly. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you next week in the classroom. Everyone, see you. Bye bye.